Okay, so it's, uh, it's good to see all of you here today at the Casa degli Artisti. Uh, buonasera. My name is Davide Spina, and I'm a postdoc at uh, ETH Zurich and uh, at the Zurich uh, University of Applied Sciences. Welcome to today's event, uh, which is uh, jointly organized by Instituto Svizzero, Casa Bella, for uh, House of Switzerland, who are kindly um, hosting us here today. And uh, the theme of the event, as you can see, is cooperative housing in Switzerland and Italy. And I guess perhaps a good way to introduce uh, today's theme is to ask uh, the, the usual, uh, the relevance question, why cooperative housing, why cooperative housing in 2022? Um, now, when, when we think of uh, urban expansion and more particularly of housing, um, we generally think of two models. We think of uh, the speculative model which is more or less uh, the idea of uh, private developers designing a building for profit, uh, and the social housing model, so which is the case in which you have state agencies using public money to provide housing for the population at large. And these two um, um, models uh, instantiate this age-old dichotomy of uh, private-public, private versus public, which is a dichotomy that we all tend to think by and is so deeply ingrained uh, in um, how we conceive of social relations in the city. But actually, when it comes to housing, there's another model which is neither private or public, which represents an alternative to both and which complicates our binary thinking about housing. And that is the model of the cooperative. Cooperative housing has its origins in the 19th century when he provided a response to the housing problem in the industrialized cities of the global north, especially in northern Europe. In cooperative housing, inhabitants are different because they're not mere tenants or passive recipients of a policy, but equal shareholders of a self-governing body that designs, owns, and manages the housing estate in which they live, um, and in ways that better fit their needs and aspirations. So in this model, the building stock, in a cooperative model, building stock is no longer part of a surplus value generating process and its inhabitants are no longer subject to the laws of the market, or at least uh, not completely. Cooperative housing has long been valued then for providing an answer to many of the economic and social ills that we usually associate with large urban agglomerations such as the commodification of the building stock, housing shortage, social alienation, and so on. And since the mid 19th century, uh, cooperative housing has enjoyed considerable success worldwide uh, and uh, has recently witnessed the boom in certain countries, like for instance, Switzerland, and to a lesser extent, Italy where it is seen, and likely so, as a corrective to progressively more financialized urban development. So, having done this uh, brief sort of overview uh, from uh, admittedly a non-specialist on cooperative housing, let's, uh, let's turn it over to the specialists. Uh, today we are going to discuss cooperative housing in Switzerland and Italy. With four, we're very lucky to have five experts. Jennifer duin barenstein from ETH Zurich, Rebecca Hirschberg from Von Labor and previously ETH Zurich as well, Anna Tagliaferri from Politecnico Milano and Aller, and Marco Giacomella and Carla Ferrer from the Milan-based ITER studio. Uh, it's going to be a very simple structure that we will follow. Uh, Jennifer and Rebecca will talk about Switzerland, Anna, Marco and Carla about Italy. And after back-to-back -back presentations, we will uh, then all convene on stage for a short discussion. So without further ado, I will introduce the first speaker of today, Jennifer duin barenstein Jennifer uh, duin barenstein is the current executive director of the ETA Center for Research on Architectural Society and the Built Environment, and she also uh, leads the ETH Masters of Advanced Studies in Housing. 
She's a social anthropologist specializing in the socioeconomic, cultural, institutional aspects of housing and on post-conflict and post-disaster um, reconstruction processes in cities. And she has more than 20 years experience, both professional and research in Asia and Latin America. Currently, she's leading two research projects, tackling the global housing challenges, relevance and replicability of Switzerland's and Uruguay's cooperative housing policies and strategies, which is supported by the Swiss Network for International Studies. And the second project is Peace Building Through Housing Cooperatives in Colombia, which is supported by the Solidarity Fund of the Housing Cooperative ABZ and the Swiss NGO Urmamond. And she was recently nominated for the prestigious 2022 ATH Kite Award for Innovative Teaching. So Jennifer, I'll turn it over to you. Yes, good evening to everybody. And yeah, today I was told that actually it's an event about architecture, but actually what I'm going to tell you is that cooperative housing is more than architecture. And I'm going to, ah, I have to, let me see. And yeah, I, first of all, I would like to introduce a bit, yes, why cooperatives are more than architecture, and especially in Switzerland, what is the role of housing cooperatives today and what it was in the past. Uh, I would prima primarily focus on Zurich, not because housing cooperatives are only in Zurich, but because the, yeah, there is a high concentration of cooperatives in Zurich, and I will give you more data about that. Yeah, first of all, what we already heard, internationally, not only in Switzerland, cooperatives started uh, to emerge at the end of the 19th century in relation to uh, the very strong urbanization and industrialization processes that led to a very strong housing crisis, to also a political crisis, especially in Switzerland. It was quite clear that without solving the housing problem of the working classes, it would also lead to a political instability. So this is one of the reasons to preserve social order, but also to improve the health conditions of the working classes, the living conditions. It was necessary to find a solution of housing that was affordable. Of course, Switzerland has a strong tradition of, of devolving actually uh, state responsibilities to communities. In that sense, in Switzerland, there was actually never a so strong social housing movement. We have heard before, so the state intervention in the housing sector compared to other countries was rather minor. Yeah, we have then in 1910, the first, uh, the emergence of the first housing law that actually allowed to enable housing cooperatives to to start building on very, with, with advantage of having low mortgages and access to land at very favorable conditions. Then the first garden cities emerged as cooperative models and they had a very strong influence on the, on the housing cooperative, both as an architectural typology and as a communal way of living in the first generation. We have a rapid growth of housing cooperatives in the 30s uh, until the 60s, then a uh, decline of the housing cooperatives, and in the 90s, with the strong housing crisis, uh, a re-emergence of a new housing a movement of housing cooperatives. Yes, there are about 2,000 housing cooperatives in Switzerland today, approximately 155,000 apartments, which corresponds to about 5% of the uh, rental housing stock. Uh, the vast majority of these cooperatives are located in Zurich, and in Zurich, actually, housing cooperatives today are about 22% of the housing stock in Zurich belongs to housing cooperatives, which means that actually 22% of the housing stock in Zurich is non-profit, decommodified housing. And there has been a commitment of the city of Zurich that by the year 2050, one-third of the housing stock should be uh, non-profit housing, and cooperatives are playing a key role in meeting this objective. Um, what is special about housing cooperatives in Switzerland? We have already heard it's a form of, it's not social housing, but it's non-profit housing. So it's housing actually not for a specific class, social class, it's very much housing for everybody. But of course, it mainly also caters to the needs of lower middle classes and lower income groups. It is, uh, it offers, uh, it's a commitment to mixed com communities. It's a commitment also, yes, to, to social cohesion. 
its uh, commitment toward what is special about the cooperatives is their architectural innovation, their very high quality of construction, the promotion, promotion of sustainable lifestyle today is something that is very much triggered by cooperatives. Participation we heard in various wins, and we also see that cooperatives are also in a way activists. They are also sort of committed to promote a certain way of living and a certain sustainable lifestyle. So yeah, with regard to, uh, I maybe go to this side a little bit, otherwise I pull up. With regard, yes, uh, the microphone here. Yeah, so the cooperatives in Switzerland apply a cost rent model, so that means that they only cover a rent to the tenants which, co which corresponds to the cost. They are in most cases inhabited by their members, that means you have to be a member of the cooperative to live in the, cooper in, in the very same cooperative. The rents are in average 20 to 30 percent lower than the rents of equivalent housing in the private market and the rents remain stable over time. That also means that actually, especially the advantage of rental housing in cooperatives is over the period of time because the value of the land remains constant. So we have cooperatives, for instance, which bought land in the 1930s for three francs, three euros per square meters, and the value of the housing, and the value of the house still refers to that value of the land. And that, of course, allows these rents to be extremely low. So we see especially the housing of the which was built in the 40s, today have rents that are maybe even one-fourth one of the rents in the private market. Yeah, the, the housing cooperatives withdraw land from speculation. We see that is a very important aspect. aspect. Today, they very often get land from the municipalities on a leasehold basis for a leasehold for 99 years, which is, of course, very valuable also for municipalities instead of selling off the land to keep this land. This allows them on a longer term also to have a control over the urban development. Um, they, they benefit also from loans from the municipalities, from financial support, and what is important, this is a conditional support. The municipalities in that sense also are able to, to, uh, to control more the architectural quality. For instance, it's, it's mandatory to have an architectural competition in order to obtain land and financial support from the municipality. And there are other social conditions. For instance, if in order to obtain support from the municipality, 20 to 30% of the apartment of the dwellings have to be given to lower income people. So it's a way of, instead of having social housing that is a sort of of isolating lower income groups uh, from the rest of the society, they are embedded in housing that is by and large middle class housing. Um, part, active participation in, in, in the process is very important. Cooperatives not only, it's like everywhere in the world, it's one vote, one, one member has one vote, so there is a possibility to these formal organizational structures to participate in decision making, but many cooperatives also really provide communal spaces where uh, the inhabitants can actually engage with community life and participate in, in this community life. Uh, there is a commitment to the creation of mixed community. This is an aspect that is very important. So very co many cooperatives do have like uh, rules, have their own rules and regulations to ensure that uh, single parents, uh, migrants, refugees do find housing in their cooperatives. So they really, there is this commitment of, of creating mixed communities, of integrating also socially disadvantaged peoples. And there is also in many cases, cooperatives are actually collaborating with, the, with various associations to make sure that they can sort of offer housing to people who would not find housing in the private market. Architectural innovation, I think my colleague will tell more about that later. It's, uh, I will not go in details, but I should say that, of course, today we, are, we many people come to Switzerland for the more recent uh, housing cooperatives which were built after in the 90s, but also historically, uh, cooperatives have always been a sort of driving forces behind innovation and uh, have always sort of promoted housing that was of very high quality. And this is, of course, also ensured through architectural competitions, which are mandatory for cooperatives in order to obtain support. 
Uh, housing cooperatives do not only provide housing, they actually contribute to the development of entire neighborhoods. We see, for instance, uh, maybe we hear more about that, or I, tell, I will show, there are cooperatives which really have transformed the entire neighborhoods. They offer services like schools, uh, kindergartens, uh, cinemas, restaurants, cultural centers within their premises. So we have seen, for instance, this cooperative calculator, which really a sort of contributed to increase tremendously the quality, the urban quality of an entire neighborhood. Uh, there is a strong commitment to the promotion of sustainable lifestyles. Cooperatives, for instance, don't allow uh, their members in Switzerland to own apartments which are basically an average 20, 32 uh, square meters per person. They, many, in many cooperatives, it's not allowed to have cars. So there is really, you have to commit yourself to make also a contribution to sustainable development. Uh, here, well, this is a few examples. I will just show you a few pictures. This is the oldest cooperatives in Switzerland. What is interesting about these cooperatives is that it's the largest. It owns more than 5,000 apartments. It collaborates with the newly emerging. So it's, it's also strong cooperation among cooperatives. It has a solidarity fund for its members in difficulty, but also a solidarity fund to promote international cooperation. It was mentioned before that I have this project, that we are running this project in Colombia, which is actually supported by the housing cooperative ABZ, one of the oldest that emerged from the working class movement and from the trade unions. You see here a few examples of the elderly housing stock, um, which in some cases now is under heritage protection. But these are some of the new housing, which gives you a bit an idea about the quality of the architectural quality of these buildings. The Kalkbreite, which uh, my former uh, student colleague, uh, Marco Iacomella, has been living there, actually. He might be able to tell something more about that. We will see here this type of apartments also, uh, yes, a, a sort of responding to the changing household compositions. In Zurich today, 50% of the households are composed of one person only, which of course also means that you need a whole new typology of housing, but also a new way of living together. And here you see the, uh, the, the notion for having small apartments, but compensated by very beautiful communal spaces. And uh, this is a, a cooperative, the Zoll House, which just opened recently also with very, very uh, charming communal spaces, which are open not only to the members of the cooperative, to the public in general. So there is this strong sense of cooperation. There is the concept of uh, Hallenwohnung, which is actually a sort of apartments that are in a sort of semi-industrial or look like semi-industrial spaces which the inhabitants can complete, complete themselves, inspired a bit by the squatting movement. And uh, you have the cooperative Megas Wohnen, which is a very innovative project that was actually uh, built by the cooperation of 50 cooperatives to, uh, to uh, celebrate 100 years of housing cooperatives in Switzerland. A very interesting big uh, housing estate that houses more than 1,300 people. Also here you see a very good quality, but I'm sure that my colleagues architects will tell you more about that. Uh, what we, is important to remember, cooperatives cannot emerge without the support of the state. I mean, in order for housing cooperatives to play a role in the decommodification of housing, in the provision of affordable housing, the role of the state is necessary. And in Switzerland, this is ensured, especially not so much from the central government, but from municipal governments. And this is access to land, which is of course a key element today, and access to financing. So cooperatives have to emerge within a regulatory framework uh, and within a system that supports their emergence. And that's, I think, an aspect that is very important to remember. And which also tells us something about the replicability of this model. Housing cooperatives can be replicated, yes, but also there needs to be this political will and also this bottom-up demand for housing that is affordable, that is decommodified, and that is of provides dignified housing for everybody. That is all from my side. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jennifer. 
It's really fascinating and thorough um, introduction to the world of housing cooperatives in Switzerland. Um, I think uh, your presentation really sort of uh, was the best possible way to kickstart the rest of the today's event. Um, and we, in the, the second presentation, we will stay in Switzerland. We will, and um, because Rebecca, uh, presentation by Rebecca Hirschberg. Uh, Rebecca is uh, here. She's a founding member of Von Labor, a research collective based in Vienna, uh, and they very much work on housing financing models and urban planning. Uh, prior to creating Von Labor, uh, Rebecca studied architecture at TU Graz and Saplil in the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And she also completed the MAS in the history of theory of architecture at ETH Zurich. And um, as part of that, uh, out of that, she became assistant on this ETH research project called Cooperative Conditions, a primary on architecture, finance, and regulation. A project which was led by Anne Kockelhorn, currently at Delft, and Suzanne Schindler, currently leading the uh, MAS in the history of theory of architecture at ETH. And this project was presented at 2021 Venice Biennale and uh, will be published in book form in 2023. So, Rebecca, the floor is yours. Good evening, also from my side. Um, thank you for the introduction and for your talk, Jennifer, which gives a very good base for mine, I think. <laughs> so we'll stay in Zurich, and I am happy to present our ongoing research, Cooperative Conditions, a primer on architecture, finance, and regulation. It was initiated by Anne Kockelkorn and Susanne Schindler in 2019. And the starting point of the investigation were the well-known, very experimental housing projects that Zurich cooperatives have been realizing over the last 25 years. And we wanted to understand what makes this architecture, this housing possible, and what are the conditions behind it. So as Dav Davide said, it was conceived as a research station for the Venice Architecture Biennale last year. So from the beginning, it was thought for an international audience, which is great that we can discuss it tonight here in this context. And the goal was to identify instruments that could possibly be transferred to other places. And the research was conducted with the students of the MAS in History and Theory of Architecture at ETH Zurich. Um, the main methods included a series of interviews like around 25 interviews with practicing architects in Zurich, but also city planners and representatives of cooperatives and institutions such as pension funds or banks who give loans to cooperatives. And we also did a lot of archival research. And on the right, on the zoom in, you can spot some of the archival documents that we found. And together with the exhibition, sorry, we did a website where you can find all the material of the wall you can also find on the website and you can read the eight conditions in parallel and we'll quickly introduce you the eight conditions. So one, an idea of sharing. So the green are the more political conditions. So two, public opinion and three, non-speculation where we, for example, explain the cost rent model in more detail. Then in red, brownish, the financial conditions, equity and debt who borrows money to cooperatives, et cetera. And here in blue, the conditions for urban planning and design, which are six land, seven zoning, and eight competition. And since many of the aspects of conditions one to seven, um, Jennifer already introduced to you, I will now fo focus on the eighth condition, the competition. And to do that, I will start with some general facts about competitions in Zurich and then present two recent projects. So in Zur Zurich, there are selective, open, and invitated competitions, but the big part is selective, so offices apply to take part, and then 10 to 12 offices are selected, usually also two younger firms. And a whole, comp like a whole industry formed around this competition scene, so there are specialized firms um, organizing these competitions, writing the competition briefs, 
and there there is always a very detailed feasibility study um, for writing and testing the competition brief. And the jury, there are usually 10 people, among them city planners, architects, and uh, for cooperative, um, cooperative rep representatives, or, and then various experts for structure, costs, ecology, and so on. And there is a big public discussion of the results, so there's always an exhibition and a very detailed report under the jury decision. And um, one very special plan that all <laughs> competitions have is this facade section, and it ha always has to be handed in in 1 to 20 or 1 to 50, because it's like the DNA of the building, because it shows whole detailing construction materials, and it's very important to then calculate the expected costs. And the cost of an architecture competition are estimated between 300 and 400,000 Swiss francs, which is about 1% of the total building costs. And for cooperatives, the city pre-finances these costs, and then once people moved in, they can pay back the competition costs. Um, for architects, of course, it's also a lot of risk to take part in a uh, competition, because you usually you, you invest around 2,000 hours, and you don't know <laughs> your chances are 1 to 12, or even worse, to get the commission. But one architect in the interview described it also as a protected workshop, where you can experiment, and if you win, the client wants the same as you do, and it's a very good starting point for cooperation. <laughs> so, yeah, architecture competitions in Zurich really grew since the 1990s, and an important figure in this context was the social democrat Ursula Koch. You can see her here in the front of the gigantic urban model of Zurich, where often also jury meetings are held. And in a speech at the General Assembly of the Association of Swiss Engineers and Architects, she, she stated in 1988, <coughs> Where the city acts as a developer, it must act in a most exemplary manner. Therefore, whenever possible and reasonable, competitions are held with the expectation of obtaining the best possible projects. But a competition is only as good as the preparation of the program and the jury. And for that last phrase, I would like to demonstrate that with the example of Kalkpaete, which we have already seen now a little bit. I will walk you through the process how that innovative architecture started. So, because it's really important to remember that Kalkpaet is not only an architectural achievement, but also a masterpiece of urban policy and civic engagement. So ideas, there's that tram depot in a very central location that we've already seen. And ideas about using that tram depot for housing date back to the 1970s, but for a long time nothing happened. And in 2003, when the city decided to renovate the depot, a public initiative formed. And part of this initiative were two cooperatives from the same neighborhood that had formed out of the squatter scene in the 1990s, which was like the re-emergence of cooperatives that also Jennifer mentioned. And they advocated for, housing, for affordable housing on that site instead of an office complex and formed an association, organized workshops, and public events. The city reacted positively and announced a land lease competition. Since it was a city tram depot, it was city-owned land. Forgot to mention that, I think. So now groups were able to hand in proposals to make how, to, how they wanted to make use of the site in the future. This was one scheme in the proposal of the newly formed association Kalkpleite. And they imagined a very mixed um, building with units of various sizes and uses. And after winning, like with this, they won that the building lease. Shortly after, they founded a cooperative. And one year later, they organized an open architecture competition together with the Zur city of Zurich. And these bubbles <laughs> were also part of the competition brief, which was then given to architects. And in the package of the 60-page brief and noise surveys and specifications how to build over the tram depot, heri like historic preservation specifications, because there was that one historic building that should be kept. 
and many other documents. So it was a very complex task. <laughs> and additionally to those very technical documents, the cooperative took some photos on the side of the tram depot. You can see the rails on the floor. And illustrating some situations they, would, they wanted their new building to accommodate. So there is, for example, a shared flat of people in their 70s, a choir rehearsal, or a bike repair workshop. So some pictures of the process. This is the public site visit. 158 firms registered to take part in the competition, and here they all pick up their big plaster models. In the end, only 55 firms handed in a proposal. And here you see the handed in plaster models and the jury meeting. An interesting aspect of, of Kalkbrett is that it was the last public jury, because for a few years it was possible for the general public to attend these jury meetings. And the idea behind that was to foster more understanding for building culture and the decision making processes. But why these public juries were cancelled again, we are currently trying to find out. We don't know yet. Um, here you see the, the plaster models of the six first prizes. The one on the top left is the winning proposal by Müller Siegrist Architekten from Zurich. Um, here you see an axometric drawing, almost from the same angle, like the model. And very special about this design was the Rue Interieure, in red here, um, connecting all staircases and shared spaces throughout the building, making it possible to cross the whole building and continuing here on the roof terrace towards the rails. And there's a big, oh, I haven't tried this. Okay, there's a big stair like leading up to the platform and the platform is built over the tram depot, which you can see down on the right. I will give you now, a, we will walk a little bit through the building. Um, okay. Yeah, we're now on the roof terrace, looking down on the stair leading up to the platform on the right. Here we see the roof terrace. Here we see a little bit more of the roof terrace. Maybe I mentioned that the film stills and photos were also done for the research project, so we only used our own photographs to illustrate the qualities we saw in those projects. Um, yeah, here you get you spot the Rue Interieur a little bit and the communal library on the right. And the staircases all have different colors for orientation. Here you get a sense of the variety of the floor plans from studio apartments until cluster shared apartments of up to 17 rooms. And here we look down the stairs again to the historic building that was kept. And here are two more buildings from afar. So, and the second example that I will introduce more briefly than Kalkpatem is very different for many reasons. So, First of all, on this map, you see all cooperative housing in, of Zurich in red, uh, which is around 20% of the city's housing stock. But Zwicky Süd is actually not situated in the city of Zurich. It's right beyond the city borders because land prices have become unaffordable for cooperative housing. So in this case, um, the competition was not organized by the building department of the city of Zurich together with a cooperative but a team of a developer, a real estate consulting firm, and a cooperative formed. And they invited only five firms to hand in a study. It was also a bit less than at Kalkpreite, but they had to hand in. And also a Swiss firm, um, a Zurich firm, Schneiderstuder Primas One. And here you see an axonometric drawing of the winning proposal. Um, the difficulty was to built for two different clients. So the, the pink part is the corporately owned part and the white part is the for-profit developer. And the site is also very, like it's a traffic junction of railways and two big streets and there's a small creek going by here. Um, the architects developed three very distinct building typologies. Um, you see the two big blocks in the center which measure 30 on 40 meters. Then you have the slabs along the perimeter. They are only eight meters deep and seven stories high, and they shut off the noise of the surrounding streets for the courtyard. And then there are those halls, where there are public facilities or workshops on the ground floor. 
and the, the cooperative buildings are easy to recognize because they're connected by those bridges here. And only like to show the design differences in designing for the for-profit developer in the white part and the cooperative cafe one in the red part, I show you two floor plans of a two-bedroom apartment. So the apartment of the cooperative developer is minimized in surface, but it has a very flexible layout. So the narrow rooms on the sides get light from both sides. And they have two doors, which makes it possible to walk around or to split the rooms into two if needed. And, and there the access is via access gallery, and there's a private balcony on the other side. And the apartment of the for-profit developer, however, is bigger and more standard. There is a clear designation of day and night spaces. And there is no access gallery, so less spaces for encounter in this building. And Right after completion in 2016, the difference in rent was only like 5 to 10 percent, but it's more and more diverging over time because due to the cost rent model, um, the rents um, stay low because the land prices are not um, reflected in the calculation. So a quick tour through the development also here. Um, so you see the bridges and the courtyard with the halls and gardens on top here like a hall building again with a platform. Um, another hall, this is a bicycle garage and an access gallery for the cooperative. Mm, here, this is a garden along the creek. This is a communal garden in the front and you look to the, towards the playground in the courtyard. Yes, and I will end my talk and the tour um, here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. I think um, you know from your presentation, it's pretty clear how there's so much knowledge that has gone and is currently keeps on being developed in, in Switzerland about how to design uh, these this kinds of um, housing complexes and buildings. And um, clearly, this is something that is uh, worth researching and it's worth going to Switzerland for. So um, we can move to the, the, the Italian part of the, the today's talk. And uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the third speaker of today will be Anna Tagliaferri. Anna ta studied the urban planning and policy at uh, the Politecnico di Milano. And uh, her research focuses on uh, cooperative housing, social inclusion, urban migration, and educational inequality. She's the co-author with uh, Massimo Bricocolo and Marco Peverini of uh, the book Cooperative Case Popolari, Il Caso delle Quattro Corti a Milano, which came out on Polygrafo in 2021. And at present, uh, Anna is community manager in the social projects department of the Azienda Lombarda Edilizia Edilizia Residenziale, or ALER. Anna, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Davide, and good afternoon. Uh, in my speech, I will try to um, have a, a quick overview of uh, how housing uh, cooperative uh, in Italy, and in particular in Milan, uh, have changed uh, according to the uh, policy framework uh, and also the market uh, variation. Okay. Uh, housing cooperative uh, in uh, Italy have uh, a long history and uh, similarly to the Switzerland, uh, in, they were born uh, in around uh, 80, 17 uh, for the same reason, like for uh, giving affordable housing to all the part of population they couldn't uh, afford. At one time where there were no public uh, policy uh, for uh, uh, providing uh, affordable housing for low-income uh, people. And um, so uh, workers that were uh, coming to the um, cities uh, looking for work, uh, they had to face uh, these uh, difficulties of funding houses. And so 
uh, they put their resources in together in order to build uh, affordable housing for themselves. And the first uh, Italian um, housing comparative like, was uh, settled in Milan. And uh, this was uh, the, uh, one project uh, uh, called uh, La Città Ideale. They were uh, thinking to plan it uh, in uh, uh, Porta Vittoria area. And actually, a part of it was uh, actually built. And, um, and it's interesting to see uh, that uh, it was born in 1879 before 1903 when uh, the Legge Luzzati um, made the that was the first Italian law for the construction of public housing was uh, actually involved. The, this law made uh, the foundation of uh, uh, municipal entities called the IACP that were in charge to uh, build uh, public housing. And with, with uh, public resources, uh, they, um, they, these... Uh, public entities, but also cooperative, were asked to build uh, affordable housing in the city. And uh, one period that was uh, hard for housing cooperative to work was also uh, during uh, the fascism period, because uh, afford, uh, ha cooperative uh, housing that were um, um, mainly uh, linked with uh, um, communist ideal were uh, like not really uh, good. Uh, uh, seen in a good way during fascism, but some of them uh, were uh, still uh, um, in life. And uh, is, if you see here in, the, um, in this timeline, there are two different patterns, because uh, in Italy there are different types of, of uh, housing cooperative. Uh, there are uh, uh, housing cooperatives where uh, the members come together in order to build a, a building and then the property is split. So after the, the development of the building, uh, there is no more the co housing cooperative. Then uh, there are the undivided ownership. Uh, so uh, housing cooperative where the cooperative keeps the property of the building and the members just rent uh, the, the dwelling out. And so the cooperative still uh, be there, and uh, then there is uh, the, the mix uh, ownership, where the cooperative makes uh, both uh, uh, dwelling for the sell them out, uh, but also dwellings to keep uh, uh, rented out. And uh, typically in Italy we have uh, the so-called red cooperative that are more linked with the, uh, the left side of the political uh, wing, and so that are undivided, more focus on rent, and uh, the so-called white cooperatives that are uh, uh, more related with Catholic background uh, that are more uh, on the private, private ori oriented, so on the property. And so here again, the, um, this, uh, you see that some cooperatives also change during times uh, their uh, uh, approach uh, to this uh, issue according also to difficulties that they face from the economic point of view. And maybe some of you uh, in Milan have seen uh, this part, uh, and this is actually the part that was uh, built uh, of the Città Ideale project made of uh, SEAO. And uh, nowadays, uh, actually, they are private, and uh, they, um, you can find them uh, at really high costs. Uh, they are rented out uh, at uh, 1,800 euro per month due also to the quality. At that time when they were built, it was agricultural land, so the, for the cooperative was um, a good area for a build, and nowadays they are totally in the center of the city. But nearby, uh, there, are, there is still a, a building owned and rented out by the housing cooperative. It was built in 1886, and uh, it's currently rented out one dwelling that is, uh, is quite uh, small. Uh, of uh, around 44 square meter for um, less than five, 50 euro per month, uh, while uh, in the rest uh, of the area, the, the prices uh, of uh, rents are really high. So in this sense, housing cooperative uh, that are uh, an import, play an important role uh, in uh, avoiding segregation in the city, and um, of course, uh, giving affordable housing. Uh, but 
and um, an important period uh, uh, in for housing cooperative war, uh, was after the World War because due to the housing emergency and also the need uh, for the state uh, to um, uh, stimulate economic development, uh, there was a, a direct finance uh, of uh, affordable housing, both on the side of rental and both on the side of uh, property. And uh, so uh, there was uh, some, there were some um, uh, ad hoc appropriation from the budget and levies on salaries. And uh, f from 1949 to 1963, there was the Ina Casa plan that were actually a national plan for uh, building affordable areas. And municipality were um, uh, defining areas uh, where uh, to build uh, public housing, but also housing uh, for uh, being selling out. It was uh, a plan uh, that, uh, for example, in Milan, uh, uh, made the construction of uh, Quartiere Feltre and Quartiere Forlanini, but uh, he's all spread uh, all around with architects like uh, uh, Ponti, uh, Quaroni, Samona, and there was a huge debate about the typology, uh, both uh, on the relationship between the building and the open space and the typology of dwelling. And uh, uh, later, the, there was this... Um, another national law uh, for the Piano di Edilizia Economica Popolare that defines some areas uh, for uh, the designa designated to, the, um, to build in public and affordable housing. And this was a, a huge uh, hint for a housing cooperative uh, to develop uh, and to expand their, uh, um, their role. And, um, But lately, uh, these policy were no more uh, ongoing. The funds were uh, canceled and dried out. There were no land plots uh, available. And so uh, it, for housing cooperative, it was really hard to find uh, areas where uh, they could actually uh, intervene. And uh, from the other side, uh, land prices were uh, growing over and over. So um, we had to wait uh, some years uh, in the 90s uh, where there were all the programs of uh, uh, urban redevelopment uh, of um, public housing uh, neighborhood uh, or uh, for um, dismissed uh, uh, industrial areas that there was there were an opportunity for housing cooperative uh, to intervene and um, so one example uh, is uh, the um, pro quattro corti project in stadera that uh, we have studied together with massimo bricoccoli and marco peverini we made the publication and um, inside that uh, they need Th there was this huge need uh, to renew this uh, public housing complex uh, that was uh, built in the 30s, uh, and um, uh, rad but the financial uh, resources were uh, really few, the public ones, so there was this idea to uh, ask to housing cooperative uh, to intervene. And uh, so for um, 25 years, uh, through the loan for use, uh, uh, the housing cooperative took uh, these uh, two of these buildings uh, uh, and through private investment they refurbished them uh, while uh, the, the, pub the, the, the ownership is kept uh, public. And so this is interesting also to see how the intervention of housing cooperatives uh, can make synergies uh, with, the, uh, with public housing. And uh, this is also a way of innovation uh, in, uh, problem in uh, times where, uh, um, of difficulties. And here you can see in red uh, the drop uh, of uh, the production of uh, public housing dwellings uh, and, um, and the whole the loans that made the council the, found the public foundings for, uh, um, for uh, affordable housing. And lately uh, we had the financial crisis in uh, 2008 and uh, so it Oh, many housing cooperatives faced uh, 
backroom C or standing construction activity. And uh, also uh, in places like Milan where there was uh, um, still uh, ongoing demand for housing, it was neither easy for them to, um, to face uh, speculative actors uh, and high land prices. And uh, so, um, but what is interesting uh, and that is that uh, in, uh, recently in uh, Milan uh, at the local level, there uh, is uh, this, um, was introduced uh, an inclusionary zoning rule for the new developments, the huge ones where, uh, that are over 5,000 square meters of gross floor. Uh, and they are demanding to provide 40% of affordable uh, housing, half for rent and half uh, to ownership. So in this uh, framework, to conclude, uh, of, due to the fact that uh, it's still important, as also Jennifer uh, underlined in, the, um, in her speech, uh, uh, to take in consideration the relationship of uh, the framework where the housing cooperatives uh, are uh, are working and um, to look at what is uh, actually ongoing uh, now in Milan. Some uh, of the housing cooperative uh, actually changed uh, and um, moved uh, on uh, service um, to offer housing services rather than building uh, dwellings or find some interesting ways, for example, making dwellings that are for properties and dwellings that are for renting out to find a new financial way to support the new intervention. And uh, thank you for the, the attention. This is the picture of uh, the uh, block of the SEAO uh, that's still uh, on rent close by the Abbiamo link on the road. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, I think you clearly illustrated the, this very long trajectory of housing cooperatives in Italy and how this is also a history of the con discontinuities rather than continuities are also what is required on the side of the Alps is to be a little bit of sort of, um, we need to be a little bit more imaginative as to how make this, this model work within a culture that I believe is a little bit more sort of geared towards uh, profit when it comes to housing. But clearly housing cooperatives can deliver that. And uh, we will further um, explore how we can do cooperative housing in Italy with uh, ITER Studio. Iter Studio is Carla Fer made from Carla Ferrer and Marco Iacomella. Uh, Carla Ferrer is an architect and urbanist with degrees from Harvard GSD and the Polytechnic University of Catalonia. She has worked as a practicing architect in Spain, Switzerland, China, and the United States, and has won the prestigious IKEA Swiss Foundation grant and the Real Colegio Complutense Fellowship. In the summer of 22, uh, 2022, Carla, which means uh, next month, Carla will co-curate and co-edit Touch Wood, a book by Lars Muller uh, Publishers, an exhibition which will take place at the Center for Architecture in Zurich, the Tzatz, uh, and of course you're all invited, the opening is on June 9th. Um, and uh, Carla's partner in ITER is uh, Marco Iacomella. Marco Iacomella is an architect with degrees from ETH Zurich and the University of Ferrara. He has worked on urban regeneration, mixed-use developments, and participatory design projects in Spain, Switzerland, and Italy. And he has received numerous fellowships and awards, including the Milan Fellowship of Instituto Svizzero in 2019, and the first prize of the AAA Architetti Cercasi. And together, Carla and Marco lead ITER, as I mentioned, which is a firm that bridges the gap between practice and research and specializing in housing, and recent work by them includes the common housing at Bisceglie, which is currently under construction. So, Carla and Marco, uh, welcome. Mm. Mm. So, um, 
Good evening, and uh, thank you, David, very much for your kind introduction. Um, it is a real honor for, uh, for us to be here today and to be able to present our work uh, in this context. And it is a double pleasure, actually, on the one hand, for being able to participate in an event organized by the Instituto Svizzero, of which I was, as uh, David said, uh, one of the first fellow here in Milan, and also the, uh, me and Carla for several months in 2019. Uh, to research exactly on this topic, so Italian cooperative housing. And on the other, for sharing this roundtable with such great uh, colleagues and experts, and in particular Jennifer, director of the Master in Housing uh, that I attended a few years ago. Uh, ITER, our Urban Design and Housing Studio, stands for Ruth or Path, Path Between Research and Practice Between Italy and Switzerland, a path that in our case uh, and today starts in Zurich. Uh, where we had the ch a chance to project several large cooperative housing uh, and intervention and eventually to experience first-hand cooperative living directly in Calcavate, as uh, previously mentioned. Coming from an Italian and Spanish background, we asked ourselves um, uh, if the so-called Swiss or Zurich cooperative housing model would apply to our closest origins. So we asked ourselves, where does the Italian cooperative movement stand? Uh, we discovered that, first of all, it is solid, and as a strong origin, as uh, Anna was saying before. And the second, they do competitions. So um, almost 10 years ago, we joined a young architect's call for ideas launched by Cicella and Comp Cooperative, that was called A Architetti Cercasi, that we won. We are, luckily, we won. Um, and uh, this was uh, the first contact with the housing model that was also joined by my studies at the MAS housing at the ETH that provided the theoretical tools to understand the cooperative phenomena as a whole. So the first step for us was actually to physically bring uh, cooperators, Italian cooperators in Zurich and to show what, what different approach and what the Zurich cooperative movement was actually achieving in, uh, in the last, achieved in the last 15, 20 years. So uh, the combination of the two research and practice and uh, this uh, small uh, student or mm, tourist trip uh, led into the development of, of uh, uh, the concept of common housing. And so an innovative approach to cooperative housing, at least for Italian standards, uh, that, uh, that uh, came, came basically from a cultural exchange between Italian cooperative and uh, Swiss ones. Um, so the concept of common housing was developed together with the CICEL, Consorzio Cooperative Laboratori here in Milan, uh, and the Conf Cooperative that is basically the mother uh, cooperative, uh, uh, one of the two present in Italy. Um, and uh, CICEL has a long and rooted tradition in the city of Milan, and what we tried and also were, were what we that were interested to, to what could be the next step for Italian and Milanese cooperative. So we worked and we developed this uh, uh, the new approach that is based on three main steps. So the first one is, uh, the, and of course, mutuated from the Swiss approach. The first one is the cooperative housing as a tool for urban transformation and for community making. The second one, the extended house, uh, which is to offer shared services and spaces that could support everyday life and also the different uh, uh, needs of uh, our growing and uh, fast changing society. And at last, a robust infrastructure that is uh, flexible, durable, affordable, and also directly discussed with the future inhabitants of the cooperative itself. Well, so I also thank you all, as, in, as, as Marco did before. And now I will introduce the project that we are building here in Milan as a pilot project for common housing. So common housing in Bisceglie, it's placed at the west part of the city, at the end of the Metropolitan One, M1, um, in, in a new development uh, called Se, Se Milano that uh, will host uh, around more than 500 ho uh, housing. Say Milano, it's an intervention that is completely private. It's been developed by one single uh, architecture office and one uh, landscape office, except of a little dot in the center where our project locates. To provide some figures and a context to the project, we're talking about uh, 8,100 8, square meters of uh, residential uh, program. This is happening in 3,000 uh, square meters of plot, so it's really a high-dense block. 
uh, we are providing 1,000 square meters of piazza that will be a um, convention with the, with the public administration, so, we, so uh, it will be publicly used every day. There will be also 500 square meters of rentable spaces that are um, also developed in collaboration with the municipality, so it will be dedicated to um, affordable rents for shared services. There is also uh, 500 square meters that will be dedicated to cooperative services. A total of 103 apartments, including one apartment dedicated to um, people with the difficulties. And uh, the target, uh, the turnout after um, engaging in an open call is um, people are under, to, und under 40 uh, years uh, for the two thirds and 25% of uh, all the apartments are for rent. This is, um, this is something that turns to be quite new for our, our client that, as, uh, <coughs> as pre previously mentioned, they, they are based in, uh, in a system that tends to sell uh, the apartments after they're built. So to provide some idea of what it actually takes to, um, to develop such a project, uh, here you can see a, a temporal time, a timeline of the intervention where, as you see, the project started uh, in late 2018. Um, then uh, the, the preliminary project was developed uh, right away and the definitive project was submitted at, at, by the end of 2020 to the, to the municipality. After a year, it was approved. And in the meanwhile, we... <coughs> Uh, we, we, we engage in an open call, which was of course promoted by, by the, um, the consortium uh, to, to, to find or to, or to invite corporate members to, to join. And, and this was followed by a, by a sequence of, uh, of phases that, uh, that are now in, in the point that you see on, on a moment of, um, of construction. It's also important to mention that uh, unlike other uh, processes, the, the particular conditions of the plot where the cooperative is located makes the that um, uh, the, the, the COP members enter in the operation almost two years or one year and a half before the project started. This is very un unlikely to happen because typically the cooperators join the process in an earlier stage because if there are not enough cooperators to uh, support the initiative, the initiative will never happen because it will never have the funding. This was a particular, uh, as I said, a particular example where th the funding was already there, so there was no need to involve the cooperators in an early stage. Do you want a question? So then, for us, the, the approach the, to the project was, was really to maximize the, the sense of community and to do that, we, we started with a given master plan that was, as I said, highly dense with four towers. And through a series of iteration, iterations, we managed to maximize the, the space of the piazza and, and also provide room for different typologies different from the private. As a principle, the project is established or organized in section from um, the street level with the public functions the first level with the cooperative functions, housing on top, and then the collective terrace at the first, at the best view. This diagram provides a sense of uh, the organization of the spaces in, in, in space. And, and the fact is that we cannot provide the names to each of them because they are now under construction and also under participatory process, they are not yet defined which is completely different from the Swiss uh, process. So <laughs> given these rules, uh, we as an architect, the only thing we could provide is really a flexible infrastructure. So our concept for the building was really this, that uh, we designed this in 2019, and it's really now when this is being appropriated, and each and each inhabitant is uh, designing its own space. This is happening right now. And we are pretty surprised of the many possibilities that 
uh, <laughs> that, or the creativeness of, of the own dwellers. Here you see apartments that have the same size, that are equal, but in, in other towers there are also different uh, typologies. We range from the um, 1.5 apartment that is around uh, 40 square meters to 120 as a bigger one. When it comes to the building expression, last but not least, uh, we, we actually uh, wanted to keep it consequent with uh, our idea of flexibility and also of a, of a, of a simple grid that will allow for appropriation. Um, so we foster the readability of the section and we also engage with uh, the past that in the history in, in Milan has a very strong tradition of, of housing. Uh, not all of the examples here are cooperative, but uh, in a way uh, we found very interesting to uh, try to bring in the past and the, and the materialities that have been explored before, as a, also as a, in a way of liberating uh, the project itself. This is uh, an image of, of the project produced a few years ago. Uh, of course, it's, uh, it's under transformation. And these are some images of the uh, current state of the art. So the structure is finished or almost finished. And, and really, this is happening. And, and we're, glad to, we're, we're glad to foster that uh, the Swiss know-how somehow can be translated in Italy. Of course, it's in, it's in, in, in its own way. Uh, but we, we are happy to, to have learned that there are clients that are willing to innovate so that the idea that uh, there's, there's not this response from society uh, is, is partially true <laughs> or par partially not true. And, and also that citizens are also willing to take part of these processes. Uh, we're also working with associations and, and community ONGs. And, and the fact is that <coughs> it's probably uh, not so much in the demand and in the society or in the, t or in the tools, but rather, as it was also mentioned before, in the public sector to, to provide opportunities and also to foster and probably uh, they're, they're just opportunities to be, to, to be looking for. Would you? Okay. <laughs> well, so thank you very much. And, and yeah, thanks. It was, it was great. Thank you, Carla. Uh, thank you, Marco. And uh, I totally agree with you. Uh, it's probably what's needed is a little bit more push from, uh, from the administrations. And also, I think it's what's really important in the case of cooperative housing is the issue of literacy, the fact that uh, it needs to be sort of um, get across the idea that this is an opportunity. And uh, I think that the issue of flexibility is, is, is not a, a non-issue because in standard speculative building, um, I'm a historian of post-war development, speculative development. And in post-war speculative development, you, you actually, what developers used to do is that they would, uh, perhaps we're starting the discussion now, so it should stop, but what they used to do is that they actually uh, designed and built an apartment, then the apartment, the interior was completely torn down by whoever bought it, just because they just wanted, everybody wants to customize. I think what you, you guys are offering is, is um, within, the, within the process that you've illustrated a way to custom, have a customized uh, dwelling without actually all the waste that usually goes into customizing. So um, on this note, um, I, I, I probably, we, we should move to the, to the discussion so I can perhaps ask the technical team to set up the stage for us, thanks.
Hello? Okay, great. So I think we have five functioning mics right now, so we can move on. So first off, thank you so much for your generous and thorough introductions uh, on these topics. I think I, I myself have learned a lot about a topic that it seems to be so important for the way our cities actually are, could develop, and it's definitely something we should explore more, and actually architectural schools should uh, should actually invest more sort of pedagogical energies in. I mean, this is something that I, I work at Eteha, Eteha actually, and I realize how design studios are actually to some extent um, structured in order to create sort of uh, professionals that can, um, can be functional in the process of uh, the, the architectural uh, competition, for instance. I guess that my main idea, main question that I would like to ask is, uh, are housing cooperatives uh, possible active actors in a social transformation or just passive recipients of whatever you know, is decided at the higher echelons of uh, si municipal politics? How active, is, can, how active can they be as um, actors? Yeah. Is it? Hello? Well, I think uh, they are, I mean, it's a mix. I mean, first of all, I think it's important to realize cooperatives are a very heterogeneous movement. I mean, even within Switzerland, you have cooperatives that are highly innovative, that are highly political, that are really activists. You will see that the new generation of housing cooperatives come out from the movement of squatters, mm -hmm. especially in Zurich, but also in Geneva. Actually, the squatting movement in Geneva has been extremely... Um, influential in transforming the whole housing system. And then you have also cooperatives that, uh, and what we are actually now also researching a little bit, I mean, what happens to cooperatives once they satisfy the housing needs of their own members? What we have seen, for instance, in Geneva, that many, uh, many former squatters now are, are living in wonderful, great cooperatives, and now they are very happy in their cooperatives, and they actually do, are no longer activists. But we do also see cooperatives that are still trying to, on the one hand, to pursue social goals, social mm. transformation, and at the same time, trying through no new projects also to be architectural innovators. For instance, the per, per, uh, Kalkbreite, we, they just recently opened a new cooperative, which was again following a very, I would say really a political process, a very social process, very engaging, participatory, and came out with, uh, again, offering not just housing, but a very vibrant neighborhood, which can really be considered as a collective good, as a public good. So you have a bit both. It's important always to remember, yes, it's a whole heterogeneous mm -hmm. movement. We cannot generalize. Mm -hmm. Even within Switzerland, there are mm -hmm. really big differences between Geneva, Zurich, Basel, Bern, and, uh, and if you go to Lucerne, it's another reality again, very how conservative cooperatives. Mm. But there are among cooperatives, cooperatives that are engaged, engaging with society, and there are cooperatives that are less. And we tend to see a transformation over the years. For instance, Abed Seth used to be, well, in the 1920s, it was a working class movement, very close to the Socialist Party, very close to the trade unions. And now it's a highly institutionalized organization that manages 5,000 apartments. It's a very professional organization that I would say continues to be an important actor, but that sees its main role as provider of affordable, decommodified housing, may, housing maybe less as a social innovator and as a transformer. S because what we also see, of course, is that cooperatives that are highly participatory, and that has been a bit of debate among the old and the new cooperatives, that participatory process take long, uh, that, yes, catering to individual needs also at the end costs more. We see a new development emerging, Cochareal, you probably know it, where there is one of the new uh, sort of wild, young cooperatives pursuing a very participatory process. And Abed said, a more, you know, uh, it was a bit of consultation at the beginning mm. with the wider public. Now they are building a high res building and they say co participation will start again once people move in. So, there is a bit of everything, and, and what we can see, but what the argument is, I would say, we, with our policy, are able to build a, a lower price than the 
cooperatives that are very participatory. But of course, the difference is also Habitat is building for members that are, for tenants that are not yet members of the cooperative, whereas the small cooperatives tend to be a group of people who build for themselves. So that's also, of course, a difference. So scale of the cooperative also makes a big difference. The Absolutely. size, the age, and the scale, yeah. So there's a sort of uh, speculative cooperativism. Where no, I wouldn't I call mean, it speculative in a sort of Latin sense of the word is that you, you basically build without knowing actually who is going to. Yeah, I mean, you have your basic commitment is provision of non-speculative, decommodified, affordable housing, but of course when you, yeah, when you have a certain scale and you build a certain type of region, you don't build for your existing members, you build for future members. So that's a bit the difference between the large cooperatives and the small cooperatives in Switzerland, mm -hmm. or the new cooperatives and the older ones. Carla? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, that's exactly our case. So the, the uh, uh, consortium that is developing because their, their aim is to provide affordable housing and they don't know who will then be the cooperator that will move in. Um, but I think we, to, to your question about the possibility of uh, cooperatives to, to transform the city, I think it's not even a possibility, it's really it's, it's really a request hmm. because as the, as the public se sector has uh, somehow uh, abandoned <laughs> urban planning mm -hmm. until a certain extent, uh, one may say, not, not completely, but uh, especially, or, or, or especially in the city of Milan, uh, really the, the, the chances are that uh, the cooperative movement takes own and, and the lands that are uh, put at disposal for urban, for urban development or urban transformation that, that through the uh, well-established, because there is a well-established cooperative movement here in Milan, it's not in the newspapers, but it's building a lot and it's uh, fighting uh, to, to have uh, their, 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 co their pieces for the land and, and in, in such big developments, they, uh, there are possibilities or, or, or it's enforced to have a percentage of houses that are um, allocated to affordable housing. But we have also to acknowledge that in Milan, affordable housing doesn't always mean cooperative housing and doesn't always mean social housing. Affordable housing is also privatized until a certain extent here in the city of Milan. So, so really, it's, it's the chances that uh, through cooperative, there, there, there might be a different way of building the city. And, and I think the, the tools are, are there, the know-how is also there. Uh, so it's, it's also probably a matter of uh, creating broader synergies and political alliances that are not taking place at the moment. Uh, which uh, brings me to the next question, actually. <laughs> you, you talked about demand for, there is a demand. And uh, I wanted to sort of uh, jump to the next question, which, which is, uh, resistance to this model? What, is, what, are, where, what are the sort of uh, locations where this model is resisted? If there is a resistance to this model, and perhaps we can extend also this question to Anna, who I'm, I'm sure you know a lot about this. Yeah, like resistance to the model of uh, cooperative housing to mm -hmm. develop. I, I think um, that, let's say, what uh, Jennifer was saying of the difference uh, of uh, how cooperative uh, are, let's say, there are small and big cooperative uh, plays a role. Uh, let's say there are, um, there are the resistance, of course, uh, due to the, um, the framework that is, um, that is set due to which are the policies that are ongoing. But if you are a larger cooperative, maybe you can find your, your, your um, piece where you can uh, act. I think that uh, in general, uh, for the, let's say, cultural side, uh, uh, or um, I don't see, uh, let's say, of course, there is profit and th there is this uh, um, idea of, um, of land and housing uh, as a, a good rather than, uh, so, of course, there is. And in Italy, we are more oriented to property. So we have to take in consideration this uh, cultural background, but, but I would say that, uh, um, if 
I don't see such a huge um, obstacles. Uh, let's say I think the obstacles are really the it's more cultural than anything. <laughs> it's multicultural, broadly speaking. Yeah, you talk I, I about culture. Yeah, let's say um, we have this idea. Idea. Let's say maybe if we we are uh, in a renting contest, uh, mm -hmm. that also the approach that I have to the house uh, is different. Uh, the way of living with the yep. community, while in Italy rents are uh, renting dwellings are really few. We have yep. this idea of a home has a, a, a good. Uh, mm. But that in itself, I think it's historically constituted because mm. Italians were used to rent until I don't know fascism. Mm. I think. And then your home ownership completely boomed in the 50s, where yeah. basically uh, the idea was that, uh, yeah, I mean, if you turn people into homeowners, you would basically change the politics in the country, which I think was very successful. And I think it's really pretty much what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That, you know, we still need to, I think you need to work in the, I towards creating a culture for, that is ready to accept this, is ready to actually, yes, Marco. <coughs> Sorry, but I think that no one in Italy is against cooperative in terms of I mean they provide you cheap housing and usually at the at, you know at a better uh, condition and at least here in Milan or at least our client like any, uh, also at a better quality than the private sector and way cheaper. Mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty interesting that in uh, I mean in the project that we we shown um, we have like. Um, people that will, well, cooperators that will move in that are, are already the third generation of yep. cooperators. So that means that, uh, you know, grandparents and parents lived in different housing cooperatives by the same, uh, uh, by the same uh, client as us. I think that the, the, the main question, of, I mean, I think there is, of course, a, a little bit of ideological uh, issue and co cooperatives mainly probably coming from uh, you know the old division between white and red cooperatives of course and of course there is a sort uh, a, a, li a little bit of also the, of the stigma of what happened in the 90s and the early t uh, 21st century in which cooperatives uh, some of cooperatives just uh, became uh, real estate uh, right. and uh, they went a little bit too much into private uh, private sector uh, or better in a speculation uh, system and that caused a lot of also bankruptcies, uh, mainly in not not too much in Milan, but can in Brescia and uh, in Emilia Romagna and so on. And of course, this also brought you know a lot of newspapers' attention and people were kind of against. But I think that the, to me that the question is again, uh, it, it sh the, the question maybe should be a little bit framed: uh, uh, who is against a more collective way of living? Right. Uh, that is uh, a little bit what we want. I mean, what was our position in this uh, uh, for for this project? Uh, and yeah, well, this is a, a big topic that maybe we don't even have an answer right now. But for sure, we we are getting a lot of uh, good feedbacks from, with, from from the project we are developing. No, but certainly I totally agree with you. And also, you know, the the, the kind of. Uh the economic and social makeup of a city like Milan, for instance, the kind of demands that, that, that you know that architects come up with different kind of uh, ways in which uh, we can inhabit together. Uh, but I, I, will, I, I just wanted to follow up very quick. Sorry, uh, Jennifer. I just wanted to say that yes, there are people against cooperatives. I okay. mean, in Zurich, uh, I mean, the private developers are not at all uh, happy that cooperatives are building. <laughs> Because, first of all, uh, they withdraw important lands, you know, from, from the possibility of having speculative yeah. housing. There is even a study that proves that the fact that there is such a critical mass of housing cooperatives that provide mm -hmm. decommodified housing has a depressing pr uh, effect on the rent in the private market. So obviously developers are not very happy about cooperatives and you have the whole right-wing press in Switzerland, the Neue Zürcher Zeitung, which constantly attacks housing cooperatives and constantly attacks the politics supporting housing cooperatives. Yeah. Because obviously uh, there is a big developer sector that is not at all interested in housing that is not profitable yeah. oriented. So there is an opposition. It's yeah. class war, huh? <laughs> Absolutely. Um. No, but I, I do think that, you know, perhaps I'm throwing that, I'll just follow, to follow up on what you said, uh, Carla, that this is a, a model that might sort of uh, offer an alternative to the state's progressive withdrawal from social housing. You know, you would, the state withdraws from social housing because, you know, governments don't have the resources that they used to have. 
Uh, but you know, this would provide an answer. That, that, but you know, in order to do that, what needs to be done is exactly to take a firm stance and actually create this, this, this space for this model to flourish and to protect it. And um, I, you know, from, from my own standpoint, I think also what would contribute to the growth of this model is exactly embedding it more in architectural culture. And I think this is where Rebecca, your, your work is, is quite, you know, you point, it's quite clear from what you said that actually the housing, the, the model of cooperative to some extent has the, since it was so sort of, uh, has been so successful in the city of Zurich, he has changed the pedagogy in architectural schools to some extent. Can you talk a bit more about that? I mean, how we can sort of embed that into how we educate the next generation of architects? About pedagogy, I'm not the expert, I think, since I am not at the studio at ETH. Um, mm, no, about pe pedagogy is not my field okay. of expertise, I would say. I was drawing my but own conclusions yes. then, so <laughs> Jennifer. <think> <laughs> What I can say is definitively we see, I mean, in the Master of Advanced Studies that I'm directing, we have students, uh, architects from all over the world coming to Zurich, right. following this master because they want to learn about yeah. the housing cooperative model. Mm -hmm. and they want to, and maybe they come with, uh, uh, because they are enchanted by the architecture, and then they discover that this type of architecture emerges through the cooperative model. Yeah. We see... Yeah, what I see that very often architects at the beginning think it's all about architecture and then they realize yep, yep. that actually there is something behind that to generate this type of innovative architecture, you need the whole system. And I think that is gradually triggering, uh, trickling down also in, in, the, in the pedagogy. So you think, I think the fact that yes, uh, Suzanne Schindler and uh, made this design studio this uh, focused in that in our ma MAS course we focus also on cooperatives because there is a demand there is a curiosity and of course there is an increasing number of students also of architects who want to work in this sector and who are also of course asking for a, for an academic curriculum that prepares them to work in the non-profit sector that prepares them to work with participatory methods so there is definitely a demand and I would say not too fast, but slowly the academic yeah. curriculum is it's responding up, to yeah. this demand, yeah. I mean, I totally agree that architecture in, is never about architecture only. Mm -hmm. uh, on that, we are totally on the same page. Uh, but then, you know, I do think that there is, I mean, can we say that there is an architecture of the, of the, of the housing cooperative? Because it is true that, you know, within this sort of uh, paradigm, you can do things that you couldn't otherwise do. Right. Yeah, we asked, we talked to eight or nine architects, I think, and we asked all of them, we asked that, like, how, how is it different to design for a cooperative compared to for a for-profit developer? And first of all, they all said all cooperatives are different, like Jennifer also said, it's very heterogeneous, but they, in the end, they all admitted that there is much more attention to the shared spaces, like especially also the landscaping or the courtyards and the facilities and like, playgrounds. Like, there is much more attention to this. Um, and often, because corporates know the, or they have experience with more of the residents, um, they experiment more, but I actually wanted to say something else. And <laughs> they minimize the spaces. And one very interesting fact, I think, about like the space resources in Switzerland is that they um, they set some rules how many people have to live in an apartment. So, so for example, a family of three can only live in a four-bedroom apartment. So, cooperatives are really thinking about the space resources, and then they put many functions in shared rooms like guest rooms or workshops. So this is. And, and this, of course, has consequences for the design process mm -hmm. for architects. And I have to say that having visited Sviki Sud, mm -hmm. I mean, without knowing that it was a cooperative, uh, uh, when I just when I just moved there, I was really, I mean, it's really different. You know, there's a kind of otherness that it's really Im immediate. Carla, you. Yes, but somehow I, I could slightly disagree on this okay. as, a, as a practitioner. Uh, in the sense that, yes, of course, there are certain uh, ratios or 
uh, also statics, if you may, that might be expected in a competition of co cooperatives. But I think it will be difficult to understand the innovation of the cooperatives with, in Switzerland without looking at the bigger picture of uh, innovation in housing in general and the embedded know-how right. uh, about housing development that is even in medium, small offices mm -hmm. in Switzerland. So, so there's really a culture of understanding the housing dimension that is really rich. And, and that's something that you learn in several projects. And then some, when working for a cooperative, then it, it mutates or it also, of course, that there's, there's uh, very key elements to that. But I think uh, somehow it's, it's, it's also important to frame this big picture um, because if there will be similar, uh, let's say if there will be a similar competition about housing, focus in housing in currently in Milan, uh, it, it will be different. <laughs> There's, there's, uh, there's not this embedded uh, know-how around yeah. housing development mm -hmm. that has also been accompanied with uh, a market development that has been different in the two countries. So I mean, you know, the, of, of course, architectural culture and the real, real estate uh, market are different in Switzerland in general. So I mean, I guess that the, the otherness of the cooperative needs to be gauged vis-a-vis uh, -vis the otherness of speculative development in general as well. So I would like to open the, the floor to the to the public if there are some any questions for our guests. Yes. Can, uh, yep. I was interested to ask um, uh, a more architectonic aspect, but still, obviously, uh, on my opinion, very very interesting. <laughs> which would be uh, the, uh, the challenging of the uh, building uh, regulations through the changing of the typology of the apartments sometimes. No? For example, uh, duplex architecture, this uh, office uh, which won the, the Baffa Rivolta Prize, they did a, uh, a building which was very interesting. And uh, the distribution uh, and the typology of the apartment were very particular with cluster uh, apartments, which in Italy is a typology which, for example, <coughs> I think uh, for my obviously modest experience is very difficult to apply. Um, Sometimes they, uh, the kind of, uh, let's say, uh, consciously uh, leave the corridors outside of the typology. So let's say, you know, they, they build up a typology which doesn't have corridors as well, which also for the building regulation in Italy, it would be more difficult, no? So anyway, the question, coming to the question would be this one. Um, I find very interesting that uh, uh, this, uh, let's say, innovative uh, way of thinking in the housing is challenging the building regulation. And the question for you and for you would be uh, how much are the muni municipalities going uh, through and go following or running behind this changing of, uh, of vision, let's say, because it's, it's prim pr primarily is coming, on my advice, the way of living, the, the innovative way of living, then a changing of typology, then municipality is responding or is responding after? Um, and how is it functioning in Italy? Probably a bit more, um, let's say, difficult as far as I, I know. Thank you. Sorry, you want to sure. oh, Okay, so <coughs> I think we start from the practitioner side. Um, I think that, I mean, going to your example of the, of the duplex architect, and I think it's uh, to, to understand this kind of typology, so also to, we should also understand, you know, Swiss regulation that is really different from the Italian ones, no? Uh, on the one end, the Swiss regulation is uh, way stricter than the Italian one, uh, but at the same time, the Italian one has, has uh, still some uh, idiosyncrasies uh, that we bring back uh, from some decades, but also they are imposed by the client itself or f by the future inhabitants, uh, meaning, for example, the, uh, the bathroom with, with a window, of course, right? That technically and legally you, you can avoid, but uh, they ask you to do and also makes a lot of things different. Um, 
Uh, in uh, in general, I think that, uh, uh, for example, the, the example of, of, of duplex, I think that in Italy could uh, also be possible, more or less. I think that doesn't, I don't see too many pro problems, maybe some rye for, you know, for the depth of the buildings, but not so much. Uh, but at the same time, I think what happened in Switzerland, uh, maybe also Jennifer could uh, say it better than me, is that uh, there is a strong uh, relationship and uh, also discussion between the cooperative and uh, um, and municipality. For example, in the in the Kalkweite project, there is a cluster wohnung that is not so famous because it's a, a little bit more disgregated around this uh, Rue Interieur. Uh, that actually is legally not not possible because uh, uh, so there, there are basically small apartments like one one room apartments, but some of them are just facing a really uh, noisy street, and legally you can't do it. But uh, since they did this cluster, they were able to negotiate with it directly with the municipality the change, uh, you know, the, the approval of of this. Um, and I think that this this kind of flexibility is really um, exist in Swiss, in Switzerland. I think in in Italy is a little bit less. Uh, but at, at the same time, I think also, uh, I mean, cooperative, uh, again, for this role that they have, you know, to provide a certain uh, uh, type of, uh, of housing, affordable housing, they could also claim to have a, a you know, sort of, uh, you know, ne nego negotiation power towards the, the municipality and then negotiate some, um, some small bits of, of architecture. Maybe I could add a little bit to that. Um, question is really interesting. The, we looked a bit at the cluster example that you mentioned, and I would say cooperatives come first. They do a lot of extra work <laughs> in negotiations, like Marcus said, and then it goes into the regulations. Because, for example, with the cluster, they had to, they had to add a dotted line um, to show, okay, it could be split into two apartments, and then it's counted differently because there was no experience with a case like that, for example. But also with the Zollhaus, with the Hallenbohn, it was very, very difficult to get a building permit for, <laughs> for this self-building hall. So I think for the architects and the cooperatives, it's a lot of extra work now, but then for future projects, um, <laughs> the work will be done. And one, one last thing, sorry. Um, there is that um, rating system for apartments. In order to get subsidies, you have to have a, um, some, like it's 100 points, I think, and you have to have a certain number of points. And in the meantime, the cluster duplex um, floor plan is in that um, brochure as a particular, as a, as a very good example. So it is, <laughs> yeah, so that's what I wanted to add. Maybe just a small, uh, a small point. I think that the, 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 the main point is, uh, is there a willingness to make something different? I mean, this is the starting point, and then probably you will find a solution, also in Italy, or probably even more in Italy than in Switzerland. As they say, if there's a will, there's a way. Um, well, I would like to thank you all for your wonderful presentations and for uh, sticking around for the conversation. I hope you enjoyed the event. Um, before we go, I would like to make a short announcement there will be another event on architecture here on May 31st, and it will be repairing access, sustainable practices in existing built environments. And the speakers will be Guido Brandi from CETAV, Nicola Bragheri from FFL, and the discussion will be moderated by Daniela Mondini, Universidad della Svizzera Italiana, Academia di Architettura di Mendrisio. Thank you very much.